Father, once again, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we ask that you would speak to your people. Give us a mind to understand and a heart to receive what thus says the Lord to his church. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Come on, one more time. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. Amen. So, today is the day that we began our 21-day Daniel fast. How many know that fasting is the will of God? Fasting is a biblical practice. Fasting is a biblical discipline. Fasting is a tool given by God for his glory and for our benefit. Fasting and prayer, when combined together, constitute the strongest weapon committed to God's people. If you want to get into a battle with the enemy, start fasting and start praying. You can break every yoke. Fasting is a tool that gets you in a closer relationship with God. And this tool can help you hear from God and receive divine directions and wisdom. This tool can get you victory over your enemy. When you are discouraged and you need encouragement, fasting and prayer will build your faith. If you have loved ones who need help, fasting and prayer is your 911 call Hallelujah. to get help Hallelujah. for your loved ones. Hallelujah. Fasting is also your SOS call when you are trapped. Come on. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. And destitute and you need God. You need to learn how to fast. If there's a sin in your life that you need to get rid of, prayer and fasting is the way to cleanse and rid yourself of that sin. Don't answer this. Anybody got sin in the house today? You need to join in on this fast. I love it. Addictions, strongholds, breakthroughs, all have to bow and give way when God's children begin to fast and pray. I love it. Jesus said to his disciples, this kind does not come up but by fasting and prayer. Jesus even told his disciples, when you come up against these type, these demons, if there's anything going on in your life, Jesus gave us not just the tool, but the wisdom on how to use it. Fasting is a tool to use in a time of desperate needs. I love this because it's the prophet Joel. He cries out to Israel. Israel was suffering from a plague, a plague of locusts. Locusts had come and they had devoured the land. And I love this. And see, in the people, they were facing phantom. And Joel said to Israel, he says, awake, you drunkards. He says, and weep and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because there's not going to be any new wine. For you have been, it's been cut off from your lips. In other words, I love this, verse 6, for a nation has come up against our land strong, listen this, without number. His teeth are like the teeth of lions. What was he talking about? He was talking about the locusts. 
the locusts had come and devoured the land, there was no longer going to be a grapevine so that they could have wine. And Joel says, look, you need to awake from your sleep. That time is over. Hallelujah. And then he goes on and constitutes a fast for the people of God to cry out to their God because there's sin in the camp. There's been sin in the land. Hallelujah. And you come on. And now the judgment of God has come upon you. Hallelujah. And you need to fast and pray. I don't believe there were just the sin that was in the land was not just alcohol. It was the fact that they were under the influence of sin. They were under the influence of not believing. They were under the influence of not trusting God. And so the prophet Joel called a fast. And this is what he said, verse 114. He says, consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the elders together and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry out to God. Cry out to the Lord. He says, listen to this in verse 15. He says, blow the trumpet in Zion and consecrate a fast and call a sacred assembly. You know, the church used to believe in this. Fasting and praying is something that we stop doing. And when I say we, I mean in general everywhere. It's funny, too, because there are history. There is history when the church used to do these things. Similar things happened during great revivals that we've had in this country. There are three great revivals that were identified as the Great Awakening going all the way back to 1700. And then there was a great revival during the Great Depression. They don't talk about it because that doesn't make news. Hallelujah, the day that the stock market fell and people committed suicide, people started showing up in hallelujah, a little place and began to pray, hallelujah, a pray. And then, and then hundreds and thousands of people began to come and pray. And thousands, hundreds of thousands of people got saved. It doesn't make the local news, but it makes the heavenly news. And then there's Azusa Street. How many can forget Azusa Street? The uh, churches like Church of God in Christ and the Assemblies of God came out of the revival at the Azusa Street revival. There's an old lady and an old preacher and some people got together and began to pray and God's spirit began to pour out and that come on, the cripple began to walk and the blind began to see and miracles and signs and wonders. Hallelujah. And Azusa Street was in a barn. And they had wheelchairs and hallelujah and canes. Hallelujah. On the wall where people had been set free and healed. Hallelujah. All because, and, and hold on, let's not forget about the Jesus movement that took place in the 70s when all the hippies began to come to Jesus and come to Christ. There was a revival going on. Hallelujah. Thousands of people got saved and started filling the church. A lot of these churches, whether you realize this, these big churches have been built because of the revival that took place when thousands and hundreds of people started coming to Christ. And what do they all have in common? Fasting and prayer. So the first order of business when it comes to fasting is you must examine yourself. Fasting is not just you fasting and asking God to get what you want. The first order to the business when it comes to fasting, I love it. King Solomon, he was praying for wisdom and he asked God, God, give me wisdom. I don't want riches and wealth. Give me wisdom to, to look over your people. And God began to explain to him how to, how to lead Israel. And I love this in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. He says, he tells, he tells uh, King Solomon, look, I I'm going to warn you on what to do when things go bad and when it gets bad because your people are going to turn away from me. And he says this, he says this, you guys know 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, when it goes bad, hallelujah, because it's going to go bad because people, hallelujah, because we're flesh, hallelujah, hallelujah, and we turn from God. We, that's what we're going to do because we're sinners. 
that need grace and mercy. And I love it the way God tells him, and he, war- he forewarns him of what's getting ready to happen. This is how you deal with it, Solomon. If my people, I should say when my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves. Did you know that when the Bible talks about humbling oneself, it's talking about, especially in the Old Testament, it's talking about fasting. And so he's telling him, he's telling, he's telling King Solomon, uh, when the people humble themselves with fasting, and when they pray and seek my face, and when they turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. Hallelujah. And then I will forgive their sins. Hallelujah. And then I will heal their land. Hallelujah. When my people, hallelujah, humble themselves and fast. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. And pray and seek my face, not my hand. We need to know who he is. Hallelujah. Not just what he can give. Not just what he can do for you. Hallelujah. But we need to know him for who he is. How how would you like your child constantly having their hand out but don't want to know who you are? And don't want to have anything to do with you. So God makes this statement that my people are to humble themselves. They must first recognize their need for God. Let me me, me go back. When God makes this statement about his people humbling themselves, he's trying to teach us that this is what humility and humbling yourself is. Before It's that when you do this before God, what you first have to come to grips with is how much you need God. That's what it means to, to humble yourself. You, 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 this is not that you have needs. We all have needs. But, but, but when you come to the realization that you need God, that's when the, that's when the, the divine humility takes place. That, is that I, I can't live life, God, with Without you. Hallelujah. So fasting, hallelujah, becomes when you humble yourself and realize how much you need God. Hallelujah. That I can't do life, God, without you. Hallelujah. I need you. Therefore, listen, do you know that that fasting in the Old Testament really means to cover your mouth? And refuse food. The Old Testament, hallelujah, Hebrew word literally means, come on, the root of it means that when I fast, I'm going to cover my mouth. And not allow any food to come in. When you humble yourself, you recognize that your self-sufficiency must come to an end. Let me say that again. Some people don't get that. I say when you humble yourself, not only must you recognize that you need God, And you can't live without him, but that your self-sufficiency needs to come to an end. Doing you without God. Doing it my way. I don't need to go to church. I don't need to pray. I don't need to read my Bible. I don't need a pastor. I don't need nobody to lead me. I can lead myself. Well, how's that working out? (laughs) Mr. Jackie said, crashing and burning. (laughs) And if you're real, we've all have crashed and burned. I don't need to do life God's way. See, you're still operating self-sufficiency. You don't recognize that that's not humility. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 I love this. It says there's six things that the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination before him. What are those six things that God hates? Scripture says a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart devices wicked plans, feet that swift to run into evil, a false witness who speaks lies, 
and one who sows discord among the brethren. Boy, have we had any of those kind of people in our church. We'd be praying to, Lord, either fix them or move them. That's my prayer. Start sowing discord. I'm going to be honest with you. Lord, either fix them or, or move them on. Because you, you're, causing, you're causing division. But we give people time and grace, right? But here's the thing that gets me. Now, I want you to just, just, just hold on. Just stick with me just for a minute here. Because as I'm, I'm going down the list, I, and I'm looking at the list, I, I got to number three, and it said, I would have thought that hands that shed innocent blood would have been first on God's list. But what's first on God's list? Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. It's not hands that shed innocent blood. But pride. And then, of course, you, I can't help but ask the question, why is pride such a big issue with God? Because pride, number one, it's all about self. And God can't reach you when you're all about yourself. It was pride that kicked Satan out of heaven. Isaiah verses 14 and 12 says it like this. How have you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How have you been cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations? For you have said in your heart, pride says to itself, I will ascend into the heavens. You have said to yourself, pride says to itself, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Pride says to itself, and I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farther side of the north pride and so the first thing when it comes to prayer and fasting God wants you to get rid of your pride God wants you to get rid of your self-sufficiency you know I did graduate from Yale so no I didn't graduate from Yale don't, don't put that out there I was just Okay, I was trying. <laughs> Self-sufficiency. It's all about you, all about what you know, all about what you can do, all about what you've done, all about where you think you can get yourself, all about, that's the first thing. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves. He didn't say that a situation should humble you. He didn't say that somebody else should humble you. He says, if you would recognize that you need to humble yourself because you need me in your life. That's the only kind of humbleness that counts. In the book of James, he says it like this. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Listen, therefore, submit to God. How do you submit to God? You humble yourself. You, you, you fast. You pray. And I love this because he said, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. There's a whole lot of spiritual warfare going on. People think they're doing spiritual warfare. But the truth is, until you submit to God, you're not doing spiritual warfare. People are trying to fight the devil without submitting and humbling themselves before God. You're not doing spiritual warfare. You're just screaming at the screaming at spirits and screaming in the air. You, you're not humbling yourself. You're not fighting the devil until you submit. He says, submit to God in the hallelujah. When you submit to God, you literally bring yourself up under the covering and the protections within the wings of God. Hallelujah. And the devil, when he comes after you, hallelujah, it's like he's coming to the door and you step into the door and then you just stand there and look at him. He can't pass that threshold. Hallelujah. Because you are submitted to God. Hallelujah. That's what it means to be humble. That's what it means to fast. When you fast, you position yourself that the enemy cannot touch you. Hallelujah. And the enemy has no choice but to back up. Back up and get up off of me. Come on, you need to know how to do. You need to be know how to, to, to hide. Come on, under the shadow of the most high. Back up, devil, and get up. Uh, what's in the way you call him? Daquan. Back up, Daquan, and get up off of me. You need to learn how to be submitted to God. The problem is, is we're not what? We're not submitted. 
And so fasting humbles you when you fast before God. I know one thing. You better not run into somebody named Daquan. That's not going to go too well. (laughs) I love this. Verse 8, draw near to God. How do we draw near to God? Through fasting and prayer, and he will draw near to you. We just heard a testimony this morning. She fasts for 24 hours. Hallelujah. To draw near to God. Hallelujah. And God showed himself faithful. She was living this scripture. Hallelujah. Probably didn't even know it. Hallelujah. You are practicing the word of God. See, God cannot deny himself. God can't deny his word. Hallelujah. When you learn to walk in God's word, he cannot deny himself. If he's the word, how can he deny himself? If you walk in the word, he cannot deny himself. He cannot deny his promises and his precepts and his power. God cannot deny himself. Hallelujah. When I walk in the word, come on, come on. I'm walking, come on, under the, in the shadow of the most high. He cannot deny himself. If you get that. You'll start living according to the principle. Come on. It is, it is the greatest authority on earth. Is the word of God. God doesn't need all this other stuff we add to God's word. <laughs> you would just trust him at his word. He'll show himself strong. Draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinner, and purify your heart, you double-minded. Whew. And that's all about doing what? Humbling yourself. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then you will hear from heaven. I will forgive your sins and heal your land. I love this. Four steps are mentioned here. When we fast, we humble ourselves before God. When we pray, we make a request before God. We seek the person of God and not just his hand. And number four, we repent of our wicked ways and turn away from that which is unholy and ungodly. God's response is he hears, he forgives, and he heals. God's response is he hears, he forgives, and he heals. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. You know, here's the Holy Spirit. The Lord's just talking to me. You know, he said when, when, when I got saved, Pastor Carolyn, for a whole year, kept trying to get me to come to a Bible study. You guys know my story. I can't change it. I'm just going to tell you again. Um, and I said, what's the Bible study going to do for me? I got problems. I'm a drug addict. I can't stop. I'm, I'm, it's, life's bad. We were getting ready to get a divorce, and I decided, God, I owe her this. I'm talking to God the whole time. As a matter of fact, but even though in my addiction, I knew I was wrong. I was still talking to God. And I said, Lord, I owe her this. Let me just go to the Bible study. I'll, I'll just show up to the Bible study. And I walked in, all these smiling faces. Now, that was sickening. (laughs) People full of joy. Look, look, they're saved. Look, look, their lives are great. And they're smiling. They're happy. And I walk in. That was hard. Why are you you so happy? (laughs) They knew Jesus. I didn't. Oh, hallelujah. The moment of, oh, hallelujah, of humility and humbleness came. Oh, hallelujah. This is why a, a lady, Sister Kriti, started speaking in tongues. And the scripture said that the tongue is for the unbeliever. Some people don't understand speaking in tongues and in and, and the spirit realm. Hallelujah. And these things that take place. Hallelujah. But when you study the scripture, you'll find that speaking in tongues is for the unbeliever. This lady spoke in, in heavenly language so, so powerful and so strong. I knew it had to be God because nobody could fake that. It was just so strong and so powerful. And I began to pray. 
And my prayer was this. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, if you take away the drugs and the cigarettes, I'll serve you. Because the drugs and the cigarettes was killing me. And I didn't care. And my, my idea of service was a mop in a bucket. I need you. And, here's, and here's, I said, Lord, if you don't do this, this is how I'm going to die. And I knew it. And it was at that moment, drugs and cigarettes were gone. And it was as if God was waiting for this one moment of humility. Hallelujah. Faith. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. That listeners, that I needed him, this lack of this self-sufficiency. Hallelujah. I, gone because I kept trying to do it my way. He was waiting for this one moment. This decision to be made up in, I will serve, I'll do whatever you want me to do. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, that was a moment of humility and humbleness. But it was also the moment I, when I met my God and he became so real to me and he opened my eyes. I don't know who needed to hear that, but I'm just obeying what God told me to do. And so our first week of fasting, we have three weeks of fasting. Our first week of fasting is that it's self-examination. It's to examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Fasting opens your eyes to see things that you could not see before. Ephesians 5, verse 8 to 14 says, for you were once darkness, but now you are in the light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the spirit is goodness, righteousness and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. But all things that are exposed are made manifested by the light. For whatever makes manifestation is light. Verse 14. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep. Arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. You know the most wonderful thing and interesting thing about that scripture is that he wasn't talking to the world. Most people think, oh, he's talking to the world. No, he's not. He's talking to the church. The letter was to the church about waking up. The letter was to the church about, come on, come on, walking in, in light, walking in Christ, and understanding truth and righteousness. The, the letter was to the church. Let me close uh, here. And I don't know what Wednesdays are like for you, but please tune in Wednesday. I'm going to talk about fasting. Um, when we fast, it literally is physical and spiritual. And what happens when you fast, your body begins to go through detoxification in the physical. I think it's a beautiful picture of God showing you, oh, hallelujah, first in the physical, what takes place when you fast, that your body begins to detox from all of the other chemicals, hallelujah, and the things that, the processed food, all that stuff that, come on, that your body doesn't need, come on, and that is stirring up, you need to de detox, hallelujah, and get that stuff, and it starts coming out your pores, and you look, you, your, your blood starts to get cleansed, your liver starts to cleanse itself, fasting is a tool that God gives gives us, come on, to glorify God, come on, and to your benefit. Hallelujah. And not only this, listen, when you begin to fast, come on, in the physical realm, come on, and you, you can think better. Come on, you have more energy. Come on, you can see your, matter of fact, when you fast and your body begins to uh, cleanse itself, your eyes will get clear. The same thing takes place in the spirit realm. It's a, it's a picture in the physical, what takes place with you spiritually. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. All of a sudden, that stuff that you used to desire that's not clean. Because this is this, this, because when you're doing it with a physical fast, you start eating clean food. 
and all that stuff, come on, in the spirit realm, that, that immorality stuff that takes place in your life, when you start fasting in the physical, Hallelujah. God starts cleaning you up spiritually. Hallelujah. You stop desiring. Hallelujah. Come on. Just like you used to desire that bad food. And that's an interesting thing about uh, the 21 day Daniel fast. You stop desiring stuff. You start desiring. All of a sudden it starts tasting good to you. Vegetables start tasting good. You start, you start tasting the flavor. Oh, that's good. Well, the same thing takes place in the spirit realm. You've got some issues in your life. And the truth is, is everybody does. So I'm excited. I hope. I hope I hope that you you have the faith uh, to believe God. For all that you're going to do. um, Because God wants to do so much in you. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's stand on our feet. Let's give the Lord a hand praise. Oh, come on, we can do better than that. I I want you to know something. And this is the, you're not going to war. When you start fasting and prayer, you're walking in victory. Don't, don't, think, don't think that, oh, man, I, I got to fight. No. Come on. Hallelujah. You, you, God is bringing you up and elevating you to the place. Come on. To sit what in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on. God is He's lifting you up to bring you to the place. Come on. That where you belong. You're not going to some foreign land. Come on. You're going home. Hallelujah. Come on. You're going to the height. Come on into the place where God desires come on you to be hallelujah he's got a seat for you he's got a place for you hallelujah come on walk in your victory walk in your strength you've been made you've been created for such a time as this God has a mission and a purpose and a destiny for your life walk in it I don't care how you struggle. Oh man, I didn't mean it. Just get up. Walk in it. You say, well, I don't know how I could do all of it. Give up something and walk in that. Whatever you decide to give up, give it up. Give up that one thing. God will honor you. He will honor your sacrifice. God knows where you are. You don't get a medal for eating it perfectly right. That's that's not the issue. The issues that you decide in your your heart that you need him. And he'll give you the strength. He'll give you the strength to make it through. This is what we call a corporate fast. And so I want us to have this corporate prayer together. Even those online, those that are on Zoom, I want you to say this with us today. Repeat this with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe your son Jesus, his sacrifice that you've given to us. As Father, today we come to you with fasting and prayer to humble ourselves before your mighty God that you would do great things and bring us to the level you've created us to be. Give us strength through this process. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Come on, one more time. Let's give the Lord a hand. You may be seated.